thank you very much for the introduction. And we're going to get now to another pivotal session of the day, uh, this one about the Dubai financial market, DFM, a man who needs a little further introduction, and a man who's going to give us quite a bit of insight on uh, what is happening with liquidity, with regulation, with growth. So let's start on, on that note, on the prospects for expansion, on the priorities at the DFM, and where you see sort of the company and the exchange by the end of this year and going into 2025. Thank you, Yusuf. Uh, thank you. Uh, and pleasure being here. Thank you for having me. Um, when you look at expansion, there are two different ways of looking at it. The first is you look at what has worked for you in the past. And this is typically the classic IPO plans and the IPO pipeline that ends up coming into the market. To give you a little bit of background on that, the past two years, we brought in about eight IPOs into the market. We have the ninth one taking place right now. What we've realized is that the issuers raised about 35 billion worth of capital. The demand that we had for that was nearly 1.1 trillion dirhams. So what you have here in the market, we have excess liquidity, at least the primary liquidity, and we have limited opportunities that can end up attracting that level of liquidity. So the opportunity for us here as DFM is, how do we end up taking that and we expand on the number of IPOs that we're bringing onto the market? And then, what type of capital raising plans we want to offer the companies that are coming to the, into the exchange? And I refer in a bit into one of the recent platforms that we've announced, which is, which is Arena, where we're looking at companies that can potentially come into the market ahead of the IPO stage, such yeah. as private, private market. So this is the first one, and I'll allow you to ask questions. Yeah, I yeah, so we'll, we'll, get to, we'll get to yeah. Arena in, in yeah. a second. I want to flesh out the, the growth point. So the ninth IPO right now, what comes after? Is it going to be as busy? Can you give us any more detail in terms of what, what IPOs are going to come this year, next year? I think that's a question that, in a way, we perfected the art of avoiding giving a number in terms of how many IPOs we're getting. But let, let me give you a little bit of insight in terms of how the pipeline is looking like. Um, in the past two years, we've launched a number of plans and programs in terms of encouraging companies to come into the market. The initial plan when we started the capital market drive was to build a momentum using government IPOs into the market to encourage family offices, private sector companies, many of the fintech companies that are present in this uh, fintech summit for them to start looking at how the market can be useful, useful for them. What we've seen in terms of the, the demand last year is that we had 40 companies get into uh, a program that we launched in collaboration with the Dubai Chambers, which is the, the IPO accelerator program on that. This is just one of the programs we've launched. The other thing we've seen is that on top of the six IPOs done by the government, about two of the IPOs and the third one that's taking place right now are private sector IPOs. And we've seen fantastic performance when it comes to both the primary and the secondary market around those. In terms of the family offices that you speak of now, I mean, I have met with many of them uh, over the last uh, two to three years, and there was a belief that a lot of the families are going to jump on the train and they're going to list in Dubai or Abu Dhabi uh, or Riyadh. But in, in all three instances, maybe less Saudi Arabia, but especially in the UAE, it hasn't really happened as fast or as much as, as sort of the initial thinking was. Uh, what do you think? I mean, obviously, there's you know, the fear of losing control of your company that's playing a big role. But is there anything else in your conversations that stood out as a reason why we haven't seen uh, as many yet? I think there are, there are a number of elements that influence when a company decides to come into an IPO. The first thing is, where is the founding generation relative to the company? So this is a relatively young region. So if you look at the country, we're roughly about 50 years old. So for you to um, see a lot of the family businesses in the past 10 years, then the founding member of the family business is the one running the business. And, and, and building a business, a family conglomerate, is like having a child, and, and it's often the favorite child. Uh, letting go of that business is something that uh, requires certain triggers. The triggers around of those are the need for growth capital, 
the sustainability aspect of it, governance, and so forth. And then having a healthy template on the market that you can refer to where you say, I can do what Al Ansari did, or I can do what, uh, what Espinis is doing, is doing when, it comes to the, when it comes to the market. And I don't think the past 10 years, we've had a template that many of the family businesses could follow. That's, that's one element. The second element is the maturity of the regulatory framework. The regulatory framework was very much around, you list about 55% of the business, which means majority, and the second, then that was reduced further down to 35, which mathematically doesn't make any sense. If you have a business that's 10 billion dirhams in market capitalization or enterprise value, 35% uh, of that is different than 55% of that. We've removed that as an obstacle, and we instead we end up looking at other aspects. What we've seen, instead of me now boring you with the regulatory changes we've done, what we've seen in the past two years is that the number of family businesses that find relevance when it comes to the market is increasing. Two out of the three private IPOs that we've done are family businesses. Okay. So it sounds to me, I mean, what the conversation we're having on family businesses, but also the pipeline that you've described that's shaping up positively, that the second half of the year and going into 24 would be at least as busy as the last 12 months? Is that a fair assessment? Um, let, me, let me give you a different assessment. If I'm we trying look to quantify the, uh, it, and I, I know, you're, you know you don't really want to give me a definite answer, but even like a range would be helpful. I'll give, you, I'll give you a different reference around that. So the past one year, we attracted about 67,000 investors into the market. This is me giving you a trajectory for growth, and I'll, I'll, I'll go back into the past three years as well. Um, what we've seen in the past one quarter, in the first quarter, we ended up attracting 44,000 investors. And we see the majority of the growth come in from outside. If you look at the IPOs we did last year, we did two IPOs, one government, one private sector. Now we've started the year, we're, now, we're, we're in May, still not done with the first half of the year, and we're done with two IPOs when it comes to that. Um, the index increase and in appreciation last year is something that gave quite a lot of encouragement to many of the businesses to start looking at a public listing. Um, in a more accelerated way. And like you know, Yusuf, a decision to do an IPO is not a decision in which you decide today and then you are in the market the next, uh, the next, the next month. 100%. It's something that does take time. The other thing that's been a priority for you is uh, diversifying the investor base and sort of the role of, uh, of Irina as well. Could you run us through how all these kind of come together to play into the vision that uh, the DFM has been pursuing? I'll, I'll, there are two questions in there, Yusuf. Let's cover the investor side first, and then I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background in terms of what's the thinking process when it comes to, when it comes to Arena. If you look at the mix of investors in the market today, we have uh, of the entire secondary activity on the market, which is the trading business on the exchange, about 47% of our activity comes from outside the UAE which is something that we're, we're, we're very pleased with, and we've been seeing that increasing over the past, uh, over the past couple of years. Um, if we then take the number of new investors that we've been attracting, the average between the years of 2014 to 2019 has been about 4,500 investors coming into the market on an annual basis. Um, the past two years, we attracted 225,000 investors. Uh, we've completely outperformed tenfold the performance, the annual performance of the years of 2019, 17, uh, 18, and 16 um, by 10 times in one quarter, the beginning of, the beginning of this year. Um, that's something to give you a little bit of background in terms of what are we targeting. The exchange today has about 200 nationalities trading on it. 50% of that activity comes from, 65% uh, of that activity comes from institutional investors, which gives you a solid, um, solid investment and liquidity base. And that, that grows to what towards the end of the year? Uh, it was, it's up from 58% last year into 65, 65%. The foreign investors access in terms of the new investors is up from 73% to 85, 85%. What we're doing to activate all of this is how much time we spend internationally in terms of educating investors about, about the market, uh, engaging with investors around that as well. I'm thinking about innovation at the DFM and specifically about ARENA, uh, which is an initiative that you put forth this year. Uh, 
Where does that go from here in terms of trajectory? Let me, let me give the audience a little bit of background for those of, for those of you who don't know what Arena is. Arena is a private market platform that we've set up for growth companies, series A, B, and C, a lot of the fintech businesses that are here that will potentially be ready for IPO in the next, in the next three to four years. Um, what we're doing, we're giving them access to our capital um, from the investor base at DFM. The theory behind that and the reason we're, we're going in that direction is that of the IPOs that we did last year, about 33% of the subscription demand ended up coming from DFM as a platform. One of the things that makes DFM very unique relative to other exchanges in the West is the fact that we have a direct client relationship. Uh, you as an investor, you end up having a relationship with the exchange itself, which allows us to serve you better. Part of that service is allowing you to subscribe to IPOs in a much more efficient way uh, relative to many other exchanges in the past. So that's the foundation around all of that. How can we use that momentum? How can we use the demand of 1.1 trillion to meet the 35 billion for you to serve the economy in a region that's extremely young? And you do that by introducing other platforms that has a much lower requirements in terms of capitalizing onto the market yeah. um, and, and attract family businesses, Series A type of businesses that are looking for growth capital, as well as businesses that want to have their trading focused in a specific area. I mean, what about collaboration? I mean, you talk about other platforms. Um, it's a question you get on a regular basis. This is not going to be a surprise. Uh, collaboration with the Abu Dhabi exchange and you know, for that matter, other regional exchanges. Where is that at? And it seems to me like it's almost a missed opportunity that there's not been more momentum into that, you know, the more synergies and, uh, yeah, to, to sort of benefit from, from a more unified story. I think collaboration between exchanges is, is a tricky thing, right? You know, sorry yeah, to interrupt, yeah. but like right now, I need an Abu Dhabi number, correct, to trade on ADX, and I need a... Dubai number to trade on the DFM. But you need one trading account. Oh, it's one trading account. One trading account. But I so the numbers, the, the numbers in yeah. the background, the numbers in the background is what your elected broker ends up ends up telling. And I think what you're referring to, we need to bring you back into the market because I think you're speaking of the market about two and a half years ago. Okay. Uh, a lot has happened since since then. Uh, when, it, when it comes to that. So today, um, relatively, uh, relative to many of the digital asset platforms, access into the, into the UAE markets has become a lot easier. And we like to believe that access into the EFM has, became, has become far superior and easier than, than other exchanges. Um, now, collaboration. In, in terms of col collaboration, uh, there are different models for exchanges collaborating around, uh, around the world. Um, one, of the, one of the main outcomes of those collaborations are how many products are dual listing between you and your peer on the other side, rather than how many MOUs do you have between you and many other exchanges. Uh, there can be many certificates proving MOUs between you and any other exchange on the wall that can reach 50s. But the real outcome is how many dual listings you end up having. If we look at Dubai today, in terms of the equity market, we have approximately 11 dual listings between us and many of the regional, regional markets. We even have dual listings between us and US, US equities as well. If you look at the fixed income, we operate the region's largest fixed income platform, and we operate the world's second largest Sukuk market. We have quite a lot of dual listings when it comes, when it comes to those as well. Um, so in terms of collaboration, we're open to working with any exchange by building a bridge that allows us to do a lot more. Uh, with, uh, with, with, with the respective exchange. Very recently, we've signed a collaboration agreement between us and the SIX exchange, which enables quite a lot for both the Swiss side as well as, as, well as the, Dubai, the Dubai side. And very soon, there will be at least two regional collaborations that we're, we're planning to announce. We're big believers of building bridges, and we'll continue to build those. I was looking at a five-year chart of DFM, and uh, it is quite a bit off the highs in terms of total return. What do you think is m maybe something investors are missing about the DFM story that could explain uh, that chart trajectory? I, I think reference, the, the main reference that needs to be made is on the GCC markets over the past two years. So we've all seen uh, rate increases in which many of the markets end up slowing down when it comes to IPOs. But around the same time, 
GCC weightage when it comes to emerging market indices end up going from 1.3% into 7%. Many of the GCC exchanges end up reporting total return in excess of in, in, in record numbers. If we look at DFM, we reported 21.7%, which is the fifth, fifth the best performance when it comes to global equity indices. Um, and the fact that we're now at a convergence point when it comes to what will happen the second half of the year when it comes to uh, rate cuts, the GCC markets have a choice of continuing with what we've been doing because a lot of the businesses we brought in are businesses that um, are high yielding securities and assets. Um, and then move toward growth markets and total return stories. I mean, that takes me to an important follow up on what the Fed is going to do or not do. I mean, it keeps to be shifting from month to month. But if they do cut rates, I mean, that's one scenario and sort of the snowball effect from that. If they don't cut rates and inflation is here for longer, higher for longer, as it were, uh, either way, it's going to play out in the global liquidity. Either way, it will have ramifications uh, in Dubai, in Singapore, in London, in New York. Uh, can I ask for your baseline view in terms of macro uh, for 2024. Are you a believer in uh, the Fed cutting or not? Um, let me give you a rundown in terms of the impact of what will happen until until year end. And I think we heard Adina this morning speak about what's the expectation when it comes when it comes to the rate cuts. I think we started the year with two camps. Camp one saying the rates the, will come down aggressively. We should expect three to four different cuts um, this year, which was highly unrealistic. Um, the, 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 the reality check that we had on, uh, on Wednesday was the exact opposite of that. It looks like the Feds are setting everyone's expectation. Now, if we end up looking at the latest indication, sentimental indication from the Feds, this is what will happen. U.S. markets have been slightly open, open for IPOs a lot more than the European counterparts. Uh, we're not seeing SPAC level activities on the market, but there is some activity in the U.S. markets. Regardless of what happens, the investors have priced U.S. equities re re when, it comes, when it comes to what rates are expected, and those are fairly accurate. So there, there is minimal impact when it comes to U.S. markets. If they come down, you'll start seeing a lot more activities on the market. I think the usual suspects out of Europe are the ones that I think, in a way, need to have a clear path. Into the into uh, uh, into the future around that because for them the rate cuts have been have been most impactful. GCC exchanges, if you look at Saudi, you look at Abu Dhabi and Dubai, uh, we've been outperforming European markets when it comes to IPOs. And the reason behind that, we've been bringing assets that have been paying dividend yield much at, at rates much higher than the interest rates. Investors price those in for the next three years means a big win. How much of, does that have to do with a resilient oil price? I mean, Brent uh, trading in the vicinity between, I mean, the range has been 80 to 90 in the last four weeks a barrel. I mean, that explains a lot of the A, liquidity, and B, I mean, it's easy to get confident off that. If I saw Brent at, you know, 50 or $60, I'm not sure I'd be as optimistic about the dividend yield and how sustainable that is. I think, I think a lot more, for us as Dubai, a lot more is, is dependent on Dubai's growth. If you look at Dubai post-COVID, you ended up having a Dubai that was positioned as a regional hub into a Dubai that is now one of the biggest international hubs as a contender. Delivery of th those expectations and delivery of D33 is extremely important. For us to sustain the momentum of international businesses coming and staying in Dubai is something that's very important. Um, a continuous supply of regional IPOs coming to the market is extremely important because the market does have liquidity here today. So for us as Dubai, those are far more important than, than other macro-related related activities uh, on that. Our inclusion on the index, our weight on the index is extremely important because that gives you a supply of, of passive, passive money. So I think if we were to use the past two years, uh, we'd say the alignment between what the market is doing and what Dubai wants to do is the ultimate priority for us. This chat has been a lot of fun. It's been fascinating uh, reflecting on some of your uh, latest plans and ideas and also the uh, 
sort of road ahead. So thank you very much. Thank you, and, uh, Thank yeah. you as well for your patience and interest today. Thank you.